There are some landlords that aren't like me. I'm a good landlord, and I'm not just saying it. I think all landlords sort of jump straight to that, rather than actually talking about the fact that a lot of, you know, right to buy, right to buy led to a lot of people, uh, you know, sorry, a lot of housing being lost. Like 40% of council homes were lost to private renters during the big right landlords. to buy push. It's not the fault of landlords, but you jump to that point instead of going, actually, maybe it's a little bit unfair that I own homes that could be used as social housing and I'm using them as, you know, a, a business. To penalise the good landlords who are the ones that are actually picking up the slack is Bizarre and ridiculous. You're not doing it to pick up the slack, yeah. are you? Like, you're not doing it to pick up the slack. No, we're doing it for also for profit. What's wrong with that? Of also for profit. profit. Is the main thing. Profit is. Be your transparent main about it. Don't be like, oh, I'm I think I've been very, very. Yeah. I think I've been very transparent. Yeah. I will say it again. I am not ashamed of making a fair profit out of the properties I own. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Britain's housing crisis a lack of housing, housing that's too expensive, housing that's dangerous to live in, housing that leaves young people and those on lower incomes at the mercy of rogue landlords, housing that the government keeps promising to build and doesn't. For the next hour, we're going to be getting to grips with all the facets of this major crisis, asking why it's happening and exploring where we might agree on solutions to get us out of this mess. Joining me at the table to do exactly that are Investigations Editor of Byline Times, Sam Bright, Community Organiser, Emma Gardiner, Political Correspondent for Joe.co.uk, Ava Santina, and Talk TV host and broadcaster, Christo Fufas. Right, so I saw Starmer talking to Sunak, funnily enough, in the um, in, at a parliament, and he said that if a child was born today, then the average time that they'd be able to get their first property would be 45 years old. So if that stat is true, which I'd assume it is, you must have looked into it, that's that's horrendous, isn't it? What the, the, the outlook for young people is pretty gloomy, isn't it, Ava? I mean, you'd have to be incredibly lucky, I think, even to be able to purchase at 45. I think, like, you think realistically, if you are fresh out of university now and you're lumbered with those huge student loans and we're looking at the way the market is going at the moment, is 20 years enough to pull together a deposit at the rate in which, you know, in, in the rate which we're inflating to start with? But at the moment, you know, you've got to put down a deposit somewhere near £90,000, and that's even with a help to buy scheme. The reality of anyone who is currently living hand to mouth, as most people, are, young people are at the moment, mm. pulling together those savings is impossible. Well, I'm going to ask the, 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 the youngsters on the panel do you rent? I do rent, yes. Do you rent? Do you rent, Emma? Right, so I'm going to assume... Like no, that. because me and Christo no, are, aren't the, the youngsters the young on the panel. Oh, obviously. And this is the thing, and it's, it's very, very... Um, uh, d depending on what generation you are, your circumstances will be completely different because rent now is going to be a massive percentage of your salary, I'm going to assume. Yeah. Correct? Yep. Whereas, Christo, you must admit, when we were younger, like wages weren't that dissimilar to what they are now. And yet, rent was so much lower, and getting on the housing ladder was relatively easy. You could put down a deposit of a few thousand pounds and it get started. was easier. I don't recognise your figure of 90,000. If you're doing a 10% deposit for somewhere, that's a 900,000 pound And how much property. is a two-bedroom house in London new build at the moment? Well, not 900,000. It is, actually, for a new it's, build. Uh, uh, Have you looked around? If you wanted to live, hypothetically, now I'm not saying that this is a dream scenario, if you wanted to live in zones one to two, which I actually think young people should be able to have access to, I don't see why young people have to travel 40 minutes into work every day. If you wanted to live in zones one to two, a brand new two-bed property, you would be looking at 900,000 pounds. Well, first Firstly, there are many places in zones two, certainly, perhaps zone one, you are correct, where you do not have to spend £900,000 on a two-bedroom house, number one. Secondly, you are, are, are in cloud cuckoo land if you think that your first property should be a new build house. Thirdly, you wouldn't you qualify are, for the help to buy scheme if you didn't buy a new build house or a recently renovated house. Actually, you can if you... If you the 5% the, oh. the, the um, help to buy scheme if it is a, you can actually do that with a, a flat now. The, the, the previous one, you're quite right, it was a new build one. You can now do it with which is uh, all, properties. Which is what everyone is invested in. Anyone who came out of university and, and got a help to buy ISA 
that is the scheme that you are eligible for. But, sec but thirdly as well, £90,000, this is what we're discussing, the £900,000 property. There are many, many properties you could buy that are new builds, that are not two-bedroom houses, that are nowhere near £900,000. Thirdly, you do not need to live in zone one or two. Well, I, I think we shouldn't make the discussion too London-centric no, well. well. I'll, I'll, I'll expand it. My first property was nowhere near London. I bought in Leeds. The way, way I got onto the property ladder was that I bought a little house when I finished university in Leeds. When I eventually moved to London, I lived in... Um, uh, in the dodgiest ex local authority flat off Wandsworth Road, a place where no one wanted to live at the time in London. Why? Because that was what I could afford. It wasn't where I was going to live forever. But I do think that there is an element, I'm afraid to say, as demonstrated by you there, Ava, that younger people think that their first property should be the perfect property. It, it really won't be. I mean, that's slightly... That, that's You've painted me in quite a bad light there. I mean, I've lived, I've lived... I've lived across London I've rented for 10 years now and I've rented properties all the way out in zone four actually once in zone five and they are dilapidated properties in areas I wouldn't say were particularly you know safe or easy to get into work from why would your but I was be paying for a, for but I was paying was, that was a I'm not looking to buy a £900,000 property. Perfect. Let's just let's just say that, set that as the benchmark. But what I am saying is that the rate of increase in price for housing is so drastic that that is the cost to buy in central London. And it's not unreasonable for young people to want to live in a city centre. I think there's actually a, so many different strands to this discussion and hopefully we'll bring them all in. So firstly, you've got lack of social housing being built. You've got the government's aim to build, they said they needed to build at least 300,000 new builds last year and they didn't, they achieved 170,000. We've got a really growing population. Rent is extortionate no matter where you are in the UK compared to what you might be earning. So we have a problem here. Now Sam, the way I see it as an older person is that there's plenty of older people and older people than myself who might be lucky enough to have one, two, three properties and young people are paying off their mortgages whilst unable to even start their own. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, entirely. And I think you can dispute the details about 90,000, 900,000. But the fact is that the average house to buy in London is now £550,000, which anybody objectively looking at it would say is beyond the first time buyer. In the rest of the country, you're right, it's cheaper. It's half that price. But we have to look at the nature of the British economy. Why are... Why are prices in London double the rest of the country because all the jobs are here, right? So you're talking about the expectation of young people wanting to come into London to work and, and buy properties. That's because they have to. Mm. That's because simply because of work opportunities, we have a regionally unequal country and they have to buy property here and they can't. And, you know, on the, on the rents thing, since 2010, and we've seen wages stagnate during that time and are going down now in real terms, um, rents have grown at five times the pace of earnings. Mm. So it's almost impossible for, for young people, first time renters, to simply get into London to rent mm. in the capital. And it's certainly impossible to rent by yourself as a first time renter. You have to share with people. And that's, that's fine, that's something that you have to do. But when you get into 30 and 40 years old and you're having to do that, because wages have stagnated for so long, to me, that's just not acceptable in modern mm -hmm. Britain. Mm -hmm. I think also there's a focus on home ownership and I think young people want to own homes because renting is insecure and renting is increasing in London and in order to have that security the only way you can do it in this system is to own a home. And on the other side of the scale there's no council houses, there's very limited stock for people to be able to get on, to be able to find a council house to live in. Private renting is extortionate and owning a house is absolutely outside of lo lots of young people's it's not one of their options. Mm -hmm. So across the board, mm -hmm. housing is so far away from being like a basic human right that people yeah. should have access to, whichever yeah. way you cut it, whether you're going to own it, whether you're going to rent it, or whether you need it because you can't afford to rent or to own. I personally think, I mean, along with the NHS, it's the biggest um, crisis out of all the crises that the country is facing because of all the things that you just mentioned and the lack of political will to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Now... I did notice on that note that the Conservatives, they wanted to bring a bill to Parliament, which was to fast build some, some housing. And it was curbed straight away from pressure from Tory MPs because they get pressure from their constituents, don't they? And this is where the word NIMBY comes into it, right? So there's on top of everything else, you've got this thing of 
Everybody appreciates the problem, but nobody wants anything new built near them. So let's start looking at solution focus. When you're out there in the community, and I know you see a lot of social housing, yeah. and the state of it is pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah, I was just going to say on what you were saying, like, I don't, I, I get that this NIMBY thing exists. I don't think it, it's strong enough. I don't think it's the sole reason mm. that governments have never built houses and haven't actually seen this as a priority. Yeah. And I think there's a bit of scapegoating in pushing the blame back to local people yeah. for not, for not, you know, wanting houses in there or new flats in their why, backyard. Why do you, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but why do you think then, if that's not, if it's not NIMBYism, what do you think is stopping, based on being at the coalface? I've got no idea. I mean, it's it's mad that we had 10 years of very, very low interest rates for the government to borrow money, to build houses, to build flats, to meet the massive crisis of housing that we know we have. You know, they said that they were going to create, we were going to improve infrastructure. How is housing not basic infrastructure mm -hmm. that's needed? Everyone that comes to see us, the people that we support, housing undercuts every other issue that people are experiencing. And... And actually, from my experience, housing even undercuts cost of living crisis. You know, people are getting, yeah. not so much now, but in the past, people are able to get by, people are able to get what they need. They're living in shitholes mm -hmm. covered in mould, whether it's private rented or whether it's council, whether it's emergency accommodation. You have families living for years in B&Bs mm -hmm. that local authorities are paying for because they don't have council houses, it seems mad to me that that is not number one priority mm -hmm. and that that shouldn't override, you know, people who don't want new flats in their back garden yeah. at a national level. And I think part of the problem as well is this should be government responsibility. And I don't actually think it should be down to local authorities mm -hmm. to take responsibility for building because it's a national problem well, and it needs yeah. to be seen as, as a need and not a commodity and, you know, not a, not a way to make money. But... Yeah something that everyone really desperately needs, and more so now than ever. I think the nimbyism comes into it where the local planning system is concerned. And we've had yeah. several attempts you know, from governments, even prior Conservative administrations, to change the planning system. And basically, you know, we've got a planning system currently where local objections take precedence over actually building things quickly. Right? So that's where nimby nimbyism comes in. I think in terms of the market as a whole, the national market as a whole, we've got an oligopoly. So we've got several very large house builders, right? that have an interest in keeping prices high. If we build too much, we increase the supply, and they don't have the growth in their profit margins yeah. that they would previously. So we need, we need downward pressure on the market, which involves the government probably either forming a national house builder or just simply building social properties mm -hmm. that then have a downward pressure and provide some genuine competition in the market, which you'd think con conservatives that in favour of competition would support. Yeah, and, and, and then it's got to be good quality housing because that's been another issue that the some of the housing that has gone up has been very substandard and then people have... And, and it's interesting, going back to sort of the psyche of people, you are correct, it's... I think we all, especially as Brits, Brits have this real aspiration to own their own home or, or at least make their own home their little castle in a way that perhaps Europeans can have much more of a mentality about renting, but we don't have that. Well, I was going to say, I think that's also because in places in Europe you can rent, you can have long leases where you really, rent for 10 yeah. years, you can, do up, yeah. you can do what you want, you can make it feel like your home, You're, mm -hmm. you, you know that you might, you know, you have that security of tenure yeah. that with the short leases here, you don't, have and I think people would feel differently if they could be more secure in their rented accommodation. I think I think you could be right. So we've got a whole now, Christo. You are a landlord. Um, I I bought a flat when I was really young, got on the housing ladder as well, and I, I found it relatively easy. I did. I didn't have to put down a particularly big deposit to get a pretty decent flat. And the key thing is, I wasn't earning that much, but my salary as a PA, I could borrow five times and get a two-bed flat. I know. And young people just do not have the same opportunity. So I don't think we were clever to do that. I just think we were lucky. OK, I, I am incredibly passionate about younger people getting on the property ladder, about anyone getting on the property ladder. I have helped a lot of people get on the property ladder by giving them advice, by taking them places, by helping them, you know, choose in areas that I think are realistic for for what they earn versus what they will gain from the property. But the big element here, and I say this as the evil buy-to-let landlord at the table, is, and it has been touched on here, for 30 years, 
there has been a failure, and your point about the interest rate is a brilliant point, a failure to replace social housing mm. stock. Mm. It is ridiculous we've yeah. not been building social housing stock. And it's actually really easy to demonise people like me who have, I guess, taken advantage of the fact that property can be bought, property can be rented out. I do that because I'm a business person. I do that because it will be my pension. I do it because um, it makes me money. But and you know because you can because I can. Um, I, I there used to be a time in this country where that kind of attitude was seen as a good thing. Now I think it's 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 more demonised, and that is because it's easier to demonise people like me. It's easier to legislate against people like me than it is to actually solve the problem, which is to build more houses. Economics, page one, paragraph one, sentence one, in order to bring down prices, you increase the supply of yeah. the product. Now, governments don't want to do that because of the reasons you've outlined about the uh, house builders, but also because so much of people's wealth who are, who are voters Labour and Tory is actually tied up in their houses and there is a real fear that by, I think, building a load of social housing, um, that, that therefore that will affect people's house prices. And you can imagine paper sell, the front page of the Express, the front page of the Mail, house prices changing, mm. house prices going down, that will fly off the shelves too. It's a big story. I wonder if it's that calculated and if there's not just a lot of ineptitude as well and just Maybe. lack of strategy and lack of vision and, you know, allowing us to sort of fall into disrepair in so many areas. It's, it's an asset. The government could have been building all of that. I also just want to you know, have the smallest violin in the room here for, for, for buy to let landlords. But Definitely I... the smallest one. It will be the smallest. <laughs> but I pay my share. Firstly, not all landlords are... Really, I'm happy for landlords to be regulated in the kind of standard of properties that they have. The properties that I have, my tenants, uh, one set of tenants have been in for at least three years. Mm. Another set have been in for four years. I want it to be their home because actually that's good business. But actually at a certain point I believe that if they are going to build new housing people like yourself shouldn't be allowed to buy any more because you've got to let there be more stock well, for people who haven't housing. even... Yeah, there should be that's social housing be but there should also housing. be new builds and we do need to bring... It is inflated beyond... Unless wages go up it's Don't totally build more and utterly unrealistic. Market rate, you build more houses that are social houses that landlords can't you know, buy. At the moment, renters, if a place comes up for rent... You've got 25 people leaping on it. It's gone before people have even gone to see it. And then they're having to go, I'll give you, I'll give you this. Like, ridiculous amounts that are meaning they haven't got any spare cash at all. It's so uninspiring. Think... And people like yourselves who, like, work really hard, like, and, and, and there's sort of this feeling they haven't got anything to show for it. I don't want my kids, who I love dearly, and there will always be a room for them if I've got one, but... I don't want them living with me when they're grown adults. It's weird. I think you're right. It is as calculated as that. I do think it is to do with... It, it's all so... Definitely. And I think it's mad that the provision of council housing for people who do not have housing is part of that equation. Like it's, And this is the point of it being about making money and about, you know, it not being something that people need, but it being a commodity that can be... And you're right, like when it was almost a fashion to be like, hey, let's watch a TV programme about flipping a house. This is how easy it is to buy and do up. Yeah. And now I've sold it for a profit. Isn't this a and aren't I clever? fun little hobby to do? And I think you're right. We have moved on from that. But I think the point you made about legislation is really valid as well, because local authorities are now, you know, the government puts sees a little boy die because of damp and mud. They're like, OK, this is terrible. We'll put tighter legislations on. If there aren't properties for local authorities to move people to, they're just going to move them and to another it, shit it, And it doesn't solve the problem. That, that's why I go back again. And I, again, I'm not trying to have the, the smallest violin in the room, but it's really easy to say, well, it's landlords. It's all landlords. And that is that is fair to a point. There are some landlords that are terrible. There are some landlords that aren't like me. I'm a good landlord and I'm not just saying I it. Think I think landlords sort of jump straight to that rather than actually talking about th the fact that a lot of, you know, right to buy, right to buy led to a lot of people, uh, you know, sorry, a lot of housing being lost. Like 40% of council homes were lost to private renters during the big the right landlords. to buy push. It's not the fault of landlords, but you jump to that point instead of going, actually, maybe it's a little bit unfair that I own homes that could be used as social housing and I'm using them as, you know, a, a business. Well, the way I respond, to firstly, I am 
you will not get an apology from me for for forming a business that makes money out of housing. I, I am unashamed about that. But you however, might be, you might however, be... um, I, I absolutely agree that the social housing has not been replaced and that that is completely and utterly wrong. And, so, and, and I pay my way. I pay extra stamp duty when I buy that property. I pay tax on the profit on that property that I... Uh, the, 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 that I make on that rent, I pay, which is disprop I don't get any tax relief on doing that. I pay capital gains tax at 28% if I sell that property for a profit. I pay VAT to the tradespeople that I use to to um, uh, do any work in that property. The government gets its yeah, pound of flesh, and I exactly, say exactly. But you, you're actually just explaining why Conservative or the government in power at the moment why might want to facilitate, you know, buy to let mm -hmm. landlords over providing more social housing because it's a, a money maker for but them. But then if they start to clamp down on, on uh, buy-to-let landlords like myself, all you're going to do is end up with firstly a reduction of the amount of housing and secondly... I hate that argument because... It's true. But you've bought that property and you've now driven up the house prices over, you know, a long period of time. I'm not saying it's happened overnight, but you've now made it very difficult for people to either I buy or rent have. because the, the prices have been pushed have. up. The government I haven't. If the government had replaced that social housing, then we wouldn't have that problem. And I will go further. I will say thank God for people like me. Because if it oh, weren't... Well, if we're going to get into the question of morality, do you not yes, think that perhaps I have... housing shouldn't be seen as a business venture but should be seen as a right? I have picked up the slack where governments have failed. If it weren't for private landlords that are decent ones, like myself, then there would be fewer properties for people to be able to rent because the government aren't building them, the government aren't providing them. Not only that, as you say, they don't seem to do anything and then there's this tragedy with the little boy that, of course, sometimes a little macro sort of a story like that, everybody is shot, Michael Gove goes up to Rochdale and addresses it. And, I, and for what it's worth, I think he might be more of an effective housing minister than many others that, that could have been in that role. Um, but how tragic that it has to but get nothing to will that change. point. I don't believe anything will change. I don't believe anything. You know, it's going to have to because, you know, migration is up and, and obviously part of the Brexit vote was people being sick of there not being school places, there not being, you know, doctors and all the rest of it. That's not going to change any time soon. Yeah, they it... have not built infrastructure. They have not kept up, have they? No, and I think um, an increase in immigration is not going to impact the quality of housing. No, I completely Do you know agree. What I mean? I'm just saying the it's given it them will. that... The demand it will. Well, we're already up shit creek with demand, and I don't think an increase in immigration is an argument to say that... No, and I, no, it, and I no, wasn't... No, yeah. abs I absolutely wasn't arguing but that at all. Just... It's very interesting to sit around a table and to listen to you talk about how... All of these figures about all of the good that you're doing by being a landlord and da 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 and the tiny violin and whatever, at the same time as two weeks ago, a coroner's report telling us that a little boy died in a council flat because of the damp and mould mm. mm. in that council flat. And I just think it's interesting where the conversation sits. And there's a lot of conversation about people being able to, young people being able to buy and the cost of rents, and there's this massive elephant in the room, which I'm glad is being reported more, mm. which is the people who live in council flats yeah. and the percentage of them that are living in, like, horrendous Absolutely conditions. Absolutely Well, post-Grenfell as well, nothing has been done still, has it? There's so many people that still have not been rehoused. It is a disgrace. And the cladding on so many buildings. And, and, you're, so and you're right that nothing is going to change. And I think um, unless... You know, this is delivered at government level, and unless unless it's unless it's seen as the number one priority, which I think everyone knows that it is, then not even priority. Then... I think it needs to be. I think all of the issues are one and the same. Young people buying houses. This is going to sound at the beginning. It's going to sound like I'm being really flippant. But young people not being able to buy houses, and then that poor boy who died in a mouldy house. Until we get a government that decides that housing good housing is a right, for a everybody. basic right for everyone, you won't get anywhere. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's worth mentioning is, like, the, the three blocks in Regina Road that were on ITV last year that were deemed as, like, shelter said that they were the worst conditions they'd ever seen. We ran a massive campaign with residents that totally exposed Croydon Council for leaving these flats to go to complete rack and ruin. Mm. There were... So, so now they're 
like balloting the residents. They're going to see whether they're going to demolish them. They're going to redevelop. They're like, actually, these flats are not fit for purpose. Those are three flats. They've got 16 other blocks, exactly the same design, exactly the same spec, built at exactly the same time. That's just across Croydon Borough. So if there's already three flats that are uninhabitable, that have got 150 council flats in, mm -hmm. and they're put, they have to put this much effort into sorting it out, what's happening with those 16 others? And, and what happens in the next 10 years when all of these 1960s blocks actually come to the end of their there's, lives? There's, so there's, things are bad now, but give it five years mm -hmm. and, and it's going to be even worse. That is not just Croydon. There is another uh, uh, estate in Brixton, Cressingham Gardens. Yep where there has been a managed decline by Lambeth Council of that estate. Why? Because Lambeth Council are, it overlooks Brockwell Park, it's in an ideal um, location, and what they're doing is they want to then knock down Crescent Garden, yep. which was a beautifully architecturally designed 19... I think it was John Major, when he was head of Lambeth Council, actually commissioned that being built. Beautifully uh, low-rise, mm -hmm. uh, low-density uh, social housing, Lambeth Council want to knock it all down, build private housing, put some social housing back there, but they're not guaranteeing the residents who live there at the moment to be yeah, allowed well, No, because that's social housing, isn't it? Which yeah. is the same thing that happened in Nine Elms. A lot of people were moved out to build that. The it's US the same thing in Haygate in Aylesbury Estate. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... It's basically completely immoral. Well, the, that's these what are left-wing councils, just... by the way, doing this. These well, are, yeah, these but, are but, Labour but, councils. Yeah, you're right. But this is the thing, is that it's across every institution of power, from national government to local government, there is almost like a cartel to, like, mm. not, not understand the problem mm. or to willfully not understand the problem and then to punish social housing tenants in many respects, right? And I think there is a... The, I think ultimately it extends back to national government. The councils can take personal responsibility, and they should, absolutely. But we've seen over the past 12 years, national governments not fund councils properly, right? And they've desperately tried to scrape together cash from wherever they can. And property being the key commodity in the British economy, they've decided to sell off a ton of their social housing stock, mm. right? So you need national government to fund councils properly, and then you need regulations in place to say, let's build social houses, not knock them down and sell them. But you also... The you also... Have been ring fenced. And the money... Just to say, the money from my stamp duty when I buy uh, buy tenant property, that should be ring fenced for people... For, for social housing to be built. And the other thing about that um, is... And another reason why this should be national government as opposed to local authority is, when you look at places like Southwark, and, yeah, you're right, Labour authority in Southwark... Um, and you look at Haygate Estate and Aylesbury Estate, the local authority was completely unequipped to go up against developers to strike a deal that was going to benefit them. So what happened at Haygate Estate? They didn't make any money from the deal with lend -Lease. They didn't make a penny. They spent hundreds of thousands of pounds relocating people and they ended up with no social housing. Yeah. Mm. Because they're idiots, right? Yeah. Not because they're callous, yeah. mm. because the local authority and councillors don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. They don't know anything about developing housing yeah. estates. Yeah. We're talking about thousands of properties. Yeah. And the other thing with local authorities being in charge of housing is you've got this revolving door between councillors yeah and developers that is so, like, absolutely, like, complete pure corruption. I worry that if we took it back under the control of national government, though, that you'd still... Well, not this one, obviously. Yeah, exactly. You'd still see that, wouldn't you? You'd need kind of national government power to be able to take on these big house builders and developers, etc. But you need regulations to stop the revolving door between government and these private enterprises, or else you're going to continue to see lurking in the dark corners of power, mm. these deals being struck. And you know what? The, the, like, the emergency that is social housing at the moment has been kept so quiet. You know, you look at this little boy, Awab, who died. Mm. The coroner's report's just come out. People, like, it would have been known that this was coming, right? Yeah. This is years on from Grenfell. Yeah. The media is just starting to talk about this. Mm. But it's, there's been a total, like, silencing of this because they're like, what the fuck are we going to do? But also, it's the most vulnerable in society because they don't have any power. They're the most powerless people <laughs> in society. And, I, and, you know, the other day when Sunak said, um, you know, we're a compassionate government, I mean, no, you're not. But also, if we've not even got the basics right of, like, having a government... Like, what's the point of having a government 
if you can't even provide decent housing for people who need it. That's it's why, like that's why. number yeah. one. Yeah. What's, yeah. Content, what's the though. point of paying taxes if it's, it's not even going to keep people safe what, with a roof over the there? The situations you're leak. describing are so stressful for the humans involved Absolutely. and the lack of respect for their life, for what their life is worth, shuffling them around from place to place. You can't get your life together. And yeah, if you if you give people a bit of respect and you give them that start, those people are going to be if you want to bring it back to economics, healthier, better, you know, members of society who can contribute more. Because if you don't know where you're going to live, if you are ill from shitty mould, you know, how are you supposed to get anywhere? So it is, it's this short term sort of attitude of just sweep it under contempt. the carpet. I think it's contempt, contempt I think for, it's for contempt. social housing right. residents. I mean, if you it look is. at, to go back to the estate that was built um, on Nine Elms, which is in South London, which is where that beautiful US embassy, well, I mean, sub subjectively beautiful <laughs> embassy was built in. Um, in the area and then there was a huge blocks of flats were built and they're extremely expensive it's where that really famous glass pool that stretches between the two buildings is and oh, in yeah. those areas you have to provide a certain number of social housing and they it's, they give you dimensions basically of like this is the basic size that a, a social house needs to be mm. and those developers literally built them up to like the millimeter they were like mm. right that is exactly the specifications i've been tasked with and not only that they were selling these flats for millions of pounds in a place where that used to be full of social housing and they told all the new social residents who were going to live there that they had to use a separate entrance nice. from the rest yeah, the of the doors. private yes. Yeah. Uh, owners. It, it doesn't it is contempt, you're absolutely these right. These sort of developments either, if we're talking about, you know, how they contribute to the economy as a whole, most of them are owned by, I think that the, the Skypool development is owned by the Malay, Malaysian Development mm. Corporation. Mm. They're overseas owned. Mm. Lots of people who have bought them don't live in them. Mm. They don't invest in the area. They don't spend on the high street. Mm. So you've essentially gutted a whole part of the city to build like, safety deposit boxes yeah. For the rich and famous yeah. oligarchs of the world. That's what we've been reading about Qatar and all the uproar around the football. I think they're the third biggest landowners in London. Yeah, yeah. So, Harrods, they own the Shard. <laughs> they own and, the Shard. And, and, and what we're sort of describing, without being over the top, it's like Victorian times. Yeah. You've got the wealthy and you've got the poor, and that gap is becoming ever, ever wider. And that is the situation when you've got cheap by jowl, social housing that isn't fit for purpose, mm. and then with these multi-million flats with a bloody... Yeah. Wait, it's funny you say that, because, you know, Peabody, the institution that came in, actually was, like, huge in the Victorian times, and they came in with this idea that we're going to make nice social housing. Most of that housing is now private, and it's being rented back to people for an extortionate sum of money when it was literally built to provide nice housing for people who don't earn very much. It's unbelievable. But mm. one of the problems as well that you have with the developers is that they will have bought that land where they will, and many of them fiddle it as well, they'll say we're building 100 social houses and then after the planning's gone through this, they'll actually, yeah. we can only do I was going to say, I'm surprised they even built the social yeah. housing to spec, let alone... then also part of that is because the land that they have bought is so expensive to start with and that is because of a lack of, of um, housing in general, mm. which has been brought on by successive governments from the last 30 years, not building houses. And going back to the point about the poor boy that, that died in the in the in the mould infested social housing, I believe that's happening across the UK. And I, I agree with you. It's a managed decline of social housing blocks. And I'd have more respect if some of these councils said, you know what, we actually want to just knock down this block because it's not some of these social housing blocks now when you look at the density of the housing in them... Like ghettos, it's just... Well, yeah, totally. But when you look at the density yeah. of the housing, if you compare it to a, to a new estate being built, for mm. instance, that's privately built, mm. some of the density of the older estates, it's, it's not as well planned as it could be and you can fit more, more houses on them. I'd have more respect if the council said, right, we want, to, we want to gut this, we want to ground raise these to the ground, we want to rebuild, but we will put everyone who lived here before back in here and we will get x more social houses out of it by rebuilding it but they're not doing that what they're doing is they're they're declining the blocks continually year after year after year i've lived in some of these blocks as well as a leaseholder trying to get repairs done 
when you are paying your service charge every month is an absolute nightmare and it is completely corrupt. They'll say they've done the repairs, they haven't. Mm. And they're doing that so that eventually it becomes too it's costly to do it up and they can knock it down. It's interesting that we seem to be in agreement about a lot of things, but your, your business yep. has benefited from a lot of these terrible things that we're talking about, right? Um, some of them, yeah, I would say. Not all of them. So, for instance, um, the I own... Do you want to know how many social housing flats I own? <laughs> because uh, that's, that's where I... So I bought a, a flat in a social housing block, which I lived in, and then kept it when I left. I'm just thinking that's an example of, like, selling off social housing... We agree it's part of the problem, but no, you've also we bought agree, some of we, it. We, no, 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 no. I agree that that selling you off being able to buy those problem. properties. No, that's not the problem. The problem is that it's not been replaced. Sell, selling a house to someone who has lived in it, who owns that house, I think is one of the most brilliant policies that we have ever had in this country. Thatcher that was a policy. Thatcher policy. The right to buy, if you have lived there, and in actual fact, I'm not. The devil would be in the detail, but I'm not totally against as well. If I want to sell my private owned landlord property, if the government would let me off the capital gains tax selling it, I'd sell it to my tenants for that, for that amount of money less. The right to own a house is brilliant. And I am not against people being able to buy social houses. What I'm against is the money not being used to replace it like for like, one property for one property. Yeah, it is about replacing it. That's it was never going to happen in that policy anyway, so it's kind of by the by. Well, it could have happened with Labour, well, did... Labour from 97 well, to 2010. Well, Labour, Labour to bring sure. Right it could have policy. happened since this, it's, it's successful. But, but I guess it didn't, and not, it wasn't built into buy to... Right to buy was not about replacing... Well, I think it was sold so, at the time that it would be. So, yeah. Hypothetically, if you're in power tomorrow, what would you do? What positive solutions would you say would have the most impact and the quickest to sort things out from the things that you see every day? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a politician, yeah, and yeah, but <laughs> I, I'd hope that I'd hope that whatever solutions were brought about would be at a national level mm. and would be focusing on building good quality housing that's going to last for a long time. So we all agree, social housing needs to be fit for purpose, healthy to live in, and there needs to be more of it. And we all agree that it is just a fundamental problem that the working population cannot afford to get on the housing ladder if they're of a certain age. Or, as well, my issue is public sector workers who can't afford to live anywhere near where they live, where they work, sorry, beg your pardon. So, for instance, not even got... public sector workers. I think, like in general, just general, just general. Yeah. yeah. I think you know, it's unbelievable if you think of people who work in the care sector, which is largely private. A lot mm. of it, people are driving like ten miles a day in London. Sorry, I'm being very London centric, but in London, that's a really long way mm. to travel to work. Why can't you live near? Well, the an another issue that's arising out of all of this, so. Um is that perhaps, so that I know a doctor, for instance, who would like to get on the housing ladder, and he should be able to, I tell you, he's worked very hard in his mid-30s. And it's just difficult. And so sort of thinking about maybe buying something in Leeds or somewhere like that, and then renting out, but then that presents an issue for those communities. You don't want necessarily Londoners coming in and buying up is the housing it, stock. It would be very unlikely he'd be able to do that because normally you can't buy, sorry, to be dull but you can't buy generally you can't buy a buy to let now without having mm. a residence of your own first because right. the mortgage company tends to think you're going to go and live in it but why can't someone on a gp salary who would probably be able he's not a gp he's a psychiatrist he's a psychiatrist so quite so... a good one senior one he doesn't get paid enough and like the flat that he went he said i just don't want to live in it it's just horrible so he's still living with his well, mum i'm sorry part of that Part of this about getting onto the property ladder, and I'm sorry to say it, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about lattes or you know having. No, those, don't. But part of it is expectation. I'm sorry. Part no, of no, it no, is no, 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 that's completely no, because that, that is. is a brilliant example. Someone who is a really useful member of society who does a job is extraordinarily clever, and you have to study for flipping years. And there's a massive shortage of them, and he's doing night shifts with people who are being sectioned, etc. Right, and then. He can't afford to get just a decent one-bedroom flat yeah. because you need a 40, 50 grand deposit. That is not possible to save think, up for. Well, people... again, I think that then for a 50 grand deposit would give you a 500,000 pound flat. 
That's, that's ridiculous as your first property. I'm sorry. That is ridiculous well, for your yeah, first well, flat. Well, he showed me what they were. They weren't that great. And no. I know, again, we're being London-centric. Yeah, but but that you is... only need to go on right move. They have bloody garages for a million pounds in some parts of London. But again, those are the ridiculous parts of London. You don't need to live in central no, but London why, for your but first why property. why should somebody who does that job not live somewhere like Harvey? You're sort of saying, well, just go and live in a tiny shithole and be, be no, happy I'm not saying it. live in a tiny shithole. But saying, that's all he can afford. Like, manage your expectations. I would have loved for my first property to have lived next to my parents' beautiful house in Leafy St Albans. I couldn't afford it. No, but there's, 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 there's well, kind of... You're talking about no, zone no, no, no. Two. I'm just saying him be able to get re live reasonably near the hospital that he works at and just have something that's quite nice and decent and not have to share it with somebody. I think that's a reasonable expectation when you've been working since you're if 18. He, if he's on, uh, say he's on 50 grand, the multiplier for a mortgage is what four, five times? About five times to 250. Yeah, so it's 250,000. Yeah. Good luck finding any property for two hundred and fifty thousand yeah, exactly. pounds in any part of London. Well, yeah. I, I and, and, and fifty thousand pounds is double the the mean salary in this country. Mm. So it's double the average. Well, so that's again, a really good you salary. Can buy places for two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, that is more like the price he's looking at, and yeah. that it, oh, it's well, it depends on how, how much do you want to get onto the property ladder. Like I said, my first flat in London was. An, an ex local. And the other was... thing was, he's put offers in and it's gone like that. I'm afraid, Christo, you're kind of out of touch with how extraordinarily difficult yeah, it I is I am for absolutely working in London, professionals but... to get anywhere. I'm absolutely not because I'm across the property sector. I don't think so, but daily. You're, you're saying you lived you lived in a, a property that you didn't particularly like when you first yep. bought your property. Absolutely. Well, we rent them. Th those are the properties that we are now paying off someone else's mortgages to live in. Like it's not. I'm not like asking for some sort of palatial two bedroom flat. I'm talking about studios now, which are up to seventeen hundred pounds to rent. Yep. And I'm not talking about living in Shoreditch or Soho. I'm talking about living in like Wood Green, which is really far away. Nothing wrong with Wood Green, but it is very far from mm. where I work. There are one bedroom flats for sale in Brixton today at 275. I don't, I, do you know what? I mean, I'm happy to, to come away and correct the record, but I would, I don't believe you. No. I've just bought one. Where? In Brixton? In, in, Brix, in between Brixton and I mean, I've, got, I've got nothing in front of me, so I can't quantify it, but I, I would say, I would bet my next month's rent that And that I bet you, you be got that. that flat quickly because you were able to buy and it like that. because I paid that. the asking price, which was yeah. 275000 it, yeah, it, it needs a lick of paint, but that's what it... That's, it that's what it's the average, the average home price in London is 550000 yes. like, yeah. that That's just a fact. That is a fact. Do, do, you, do you think I've made that up? Do you think I'm lying? I don't want to be rude, but I do a little bit. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm not lying. <laughs> I'm, I'm not lying. I, 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 I could give you the address afterwards. I, I have just bought a flat in Brixton Can I sleep for £275,000. Yeah. And you know what? It's in an ex local authority block. It is not the most amazing place, but it's, it's low rise. It's got a little balcony which overlooks um, a, 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 a nice park. I nearly gave away the location then. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Those properties are out there, but people, I'm afraid to say, who want to get onto the property ladder and buy, they would look at places like that and think, well, I don't want to live there. No sense. No how, sense. how much will you rent it out for? Would, yeah, you, like, would you like to live there? It was... Ex it's not... Would a, you like to live there now? Probably not now. Right. But I would, uh, but in my but 20s, I would have lived there in a second. This guy it's is nicer. in his 20s. It's He's nicer like, than the, you, yeah, so you're than the saying, flat I had when but, I was in my 20s. Yeah, so I lived in a, a sort of crazy flat with a pigeon up the chimney as well. We've all done that. It's like your student days or when you're really, really young. And then you're in your 30s and, and it is different. And I don't think people do want to particularly live in the same kind of well, house that they did then. And I know you're probably thinking, you know, you're linking on from a completely different viewpoint from people in social housing. But I think that young professionals, like you're saying, that people who've worked their tits off and they're in their thirties, and then it's like, well, just go and live somewhere that I'd have been happy to live in when I'm in my when I was a well, student. A few years younger when I was in my twenties. And of course, that is what they'll have to do. But, what, but, but the point is, it is much, much harder. And actually, the average property price in Brixton, I'm being told by my elves, is six hundred and fifty-eight thousand pounds. And that would be. So there are year. always anomalies that think you think well, you prove a wider rule that you can't. That you can't buy somewhere Average like that. Average yeah, property you, price in Brixton. Like you're, you're obviously going to post this on Twitter, Christo, and say that we're wrong. So you know, maybe we'll have to admit that you're wrong. But in general, it's just it's an anomaly. You're using an anomaly anomaly to yeah, prove a rule that doesn't you're, exist. You're, you're, because the average will be also the houses in Brixton that are 
without a doubt. I one and a half, think... two million pounds. But this is a, but this is a good point. This is a good point. This is a good point. This is a different level of the property ladder. You're talking about how people get onto the ladder. Yes. Just my question, right? How does someone build a family and stay in a city? And you know, we could be talking about Manchester. We could be talking about Bristol, or you know, even across you know, even across the Mersey. You know, how do people develop a family and stay in those cities? With, it, with the housing market as it currently is? Well, if you're asking what, as in move on, well, hopefully they either make a little money from their property and sell it, and then, yeah, maybe they have to make a decision to move a little further out. That's what you have to do. A little Sorry. further out? No, yes. yes. I mean, the, the average house price in the South East is getting on 400,000. Well, if yeah, you yeah, are, yeah, again, is. now you're not talking about one person on their own. You're talking about two people who are probably both earning. So... Therefore, you've got double the salary. You've got the deposit that you've got from the money you've just made. Stagnating salaries. Selling. Stagnating salaries. I, doesn't, I think where we differ, Christo, is I recognise how blooming lucky I was to get my flat when I did and that it was nothing clever about me. It was just the time that the it was. I, the idea that housing should be something you get lucky on or that you have to pay your dues and live in... Like, why can't we just see housing as everyone being yeah. having access to a nice home yeah. that is stable and secure... And, you know, council housing, the, so many more people used to live in council. It wasn't seen as like this emergency yeah. when you're absolutely at the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. You get how council it was, it was for working people yeah. and it was a I sustainable way. I don't disagree way. with you on that. I, I, that. I do not disagree with you. Of course, but you're but talking the about... The onus is for the government to build those. 100%. But you are existing and making money from the system that is very different to the one we're talking about. But, right? I, so you're kind I, of yeah, benefiting from it, but I, also I, being like, oh, and all, but, but actually it would be better like am. this. I absolutely am. I also don't think that and I'm paying the, taxes from my yeah, benefit. Yeah, but I don't think enough of the onus is actually on you and landlords in general to keep those properties in good nick to rent them out. I mean... If you look at the private centre, the sector, sorry, there's something like 20% of private renters are renting houses which are like energy efficiency E and below, which basically means that you turn heating on and your heating goes out the window. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got mould growing as a result of that and it's a wet and damp, horrid place. There is no onus mm. on landlords to have to make those houses mm. better places to live. Are you, not you say you're a good landlord, yeah. but can you not see that there are huge loopholes that you're able to exploit? Well, as a good landlord, I, I have no problem if they were to say to me, as I think is actually coming in now, certain properties you can't get mortgages on, for instance, if they are below, I think, a D... Rating. I think it's 2025 that's going to come yeah, in. Fine, yeah, fine, great. I'm, I've no problem with that at all. I've no problem with, if you're talking about damp patches, if you're talking about there being more uh, regulation on making sure that they are decent I mean, for properties. me, I'm just talking about the industry of making money off people having somewhere to live. Well, I'm and sorry, I appreciate... you have to pay for something. You have to pay for yeah, something. Yeah, no, I'll pay for it. I don't want yeah. you to make profit from it, though. Well, that's ridiculous. We live in a profit-driven society. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Problem. Food we, is a food of the all, human right. We always have make a done. profit on food. We always have done, but now it's like neoliberalism on acid, and it has yeah. gone too far the other way. And I agree with you that like there should just be some basics, yeah. and it, it it should compute. I know it sounds a bit bog standard. You go to school, you leave, you try and get a job, you uh, you get home. And that just it, that just can't happen. You're saying, oh, we'll just go and live somewhere that's really bollocks. And then if you've no, got, I'm a, not saying you, really you, bollocks. you kind of did. You said you, you really bollocks. I'm saying you have to no, know where you're standing. No, it's absolutely lovely. Yeah, but but I think like you say, if you've got a family in and you're trying to get a quarter of a million pound property, if you can find one that's got one bedroom, you know, the, the fact is, Christo, it needs to be solved. It needs to change. Well, absolutely, and that's it? why I think building houses is going to be the way to solve it. Yeah. Secondly, I'm sorry, there are many things that we consider to be human rights mm. that people make money out of. Yeah, but it, it, there the, are. The, question is, the question is how much. Clothing is a human the right, food is, is a human right, housing is a human but you right. But you, you generally tax stuff that has lots of negative externalities that have negative social consequences, right? And landlordism, rampant landlord... Lo, lo, ramp, sorry. Rampant landlordism. Rampant landlords. Rampant, yeah. rampant landlords like you. <laughs> <laughs> Point rampant. the finger. You know, that has a lot of negative social consequences. So you tax it more. You, which, which I would tax you. I would tax you out of existence, Krista. Well, if then I could. what you'll end up probably ha happening then is, firstly, you'd end up with a situation where, as you see when rent controls uh, happen, that the person who that it gets passed on to the person who's renting the property, or landlords would say, "Well, actually, my property's paid off. I just won't rent it out." Just won't bother. Just keep it. Well, I'm not going to have no, a multiple tax empty. That. I tax that. I'd say that no, you can't. You can't have an empty property just sitting there. 
not being and, not being left. Can I also say with the rent controls, the removal of rent controls in the 90s and like the rise of buy to let mortgages is the reason that we are in the situation we're in now. So the, the only people who fight back against rent controls, I'm sorry, but our landlords, and you hear it from the government, they're talking about it all the time, oh, you, it will be disastrous. Well, Sadiq Khan mentioned it, didn't he? Yeah. Sturgeon he did, is yes. doing it. Yeah, Sturgeon is doing it. But and the, the number of properties that it. have been available for rent in Scotland has gone down since she has done it. I think that's OK. Let's, that's the truth. Let's just go. Let's, let's go a bit slower. I mean, we're in a situation. Before she brought in that policy, I was uh, going around Glasgow and I was doing a, a, a big long piece there. I was talking to students who were genuinely telling me they were queuing up forty down the street to look at one property. There was there was simply not enough houses in so Glasgow. Why would you want to so I think it's ridiculous, and I think it's houses. a little bit of a rampant tabloid story to suddenly go. Well, the rent controls are throwing everything. Well, so I've got that from the BBC actually. Yeah, well, so okay, they rampant well. Tabloid. Come on. Also, you know, when you look at the, the Tories will push that line. You've got a quarter of Tory MPs are landlords. Obviously, again, push the line that rent controls don't work. I'm, I'm sorry, no. What I feel you have done is that you and a few others around this table, kind of all of you, have fallen into the trap of saying, right, well, the easy solution is to demonise the landlord. And the easy solution is to say, well, we'll put in rent controls, a policy which reduces the number of properties available, rather than solving the problem, which is and which is what you're doing, letting the government off the hook for not building more houses. No, I, 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 think, I the, think we all agree that the government yeah. needs to build yeah, more houses. Yeah, well, I think then, that's the majority then, of the solution. Penalising the only people that are providing decent housing at the moment, some of whom aren't. I don't think you are providing decent housing. Well, as I'm not here to represent bad landlords, yeah. I'm here to represent good ones. But 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 to penalise the good landlords who are the ones that are actually picking up the slack is bizarre and ridiculous. You're not doing it to pick up the slack, <laughs> yeah. are you? You're not doing it to pick up the slack. No, we're doing it for also for profit. What's wrong with that? Also for profit. Be, is the main thing. Profit is be your transparent main about it. Don't be like, oh, I'm I think I've been very, housing. very, I think yeah. I've been very transparent. Yeah. I will say it again. I am not ashamed of making a fair profit out of the properties I own. What I will say is um, the tenants that have been in there for the last three years have not had a rent it's rise. Not, I'm not going to clap my hands because you have been providing decent housing. That should be a standard. Yeah. <laughs> you're not picking up the slack because you're doing the absolute minimum and maybe more that you should be, that you should be doing given that you are a landlord. Yes. Like, that's just your duty as a landlord. What to to to, to, to right, provide okay. to provide of decent course, housing? Of course, but I you're absolutely making it sound agree. like you're doing a wonderful thing because you're because you're like at a level that you're. Well, in fairness, I'm responding. I'm responding to the idea that all landlords are terrible, and I'm trying to point well, out no, that some of us aren't. I don't think we've said all landlords are terrible. I think that we're responding to you quite valiantly coming out and saying I'm the Mother Teresa of all landlords, and we're not <laughs> that bad. You yeah. know? Well, I'm saying that, that why penalise the people? You're not doing it to up pick the up the slack. But you're not doing it to. You can't get an extra bonus people point who, for like I up said, the slack. People who, people who supply food aren't just doing it for the goodness of no, their but heart. I'm not going to be like it. Sainsbury's. Thank you so much. Also, for Sainsbury's is regulated. Food is regulated in the same way well, that housing so is being. Be. So is being a landlord. But well, I would, no, and I'm not against you saying more that, that really if you more. want me to have a higher standard of property, that's fine. My properties are are of a brilliant standard. Already, so I have nothing to fear. I think this is the problem. This is the, thing. this is the thing. It's about the system. It is about the system. Like there are maybe a few good landlords out there, but the system as it's currently created means that the majority of them are incentivized purely by profit, which means they're going to not do repairs. They're going to kick uh, the tenants out after six months if they can hike the price up. Well, I again, I you, exactly. I've you're, not done you're, that. But you're using an anomaly again. You are an anomaly, unfortunately. Because well, perhaps the I'm the wrong landlord to have at the table, but. The system incentivizes the profit above social decency. Well, I think that's bad business, actually. Mm. I don't all... I, and again, you know, picking up on your point, I don't just look after my properties because it's the decent thing to do. I also do it because it's... It, I, if I've you've got foolish. a queue of 20 people down the road who are going to rent your property either way, then... You yeah. don't need to bother. No, well, no, of course okay. I don't, but I do because I don't want to be I not think, a decent person when I do it. Look, the, the good thing is we've all agreed there needs to be more social housing built and we've all agreed the government needs to build more housing. Other than that, we've solved absolutely nothing. But have you seen the film A Few Good Men? I think there should be A Few Good Landlords. Yes. To do a new uh, movie. Very good. Could I call myself the patron saint of landlords, actually, because I, I would do quite Who's like... Who's going to play Christo oh, is sure. the big question. <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. I think, we've tried, I think we've done this in a previous table, actually. 
What? You better not say Tom Hiddleston again. <laughs> well, I, play, I don't think that was me, but I'll take to, Tom Hardy, I think, would be... Uh, there you go. We can look the same in the same light. There you go. I'm not sure Emma's going to be going to see that one with the popcorn. But we'll see. <laughs> thank you so much. That's all we've got time for tonight, but thank you a lot for joining us. And I hope you found the conversation enlightening. If you did, let us know in the comments below or on Twitter. And if you want to support Byline TV, you can do so by becoming a member at byline.tv forward slash join and use the code as well, the table in capitals, to get your first month for just two pounds. In the meantime, I'll see you next time. Good night and thank you so much to my amazing panel.